So hello, everybody. I'm so excited to be talking to you today in the form of this presentation. I've been in communication with a lot of you through this whole process. And so this is really exciting for me to be able to finally present some information for you. So the first slide here is just going to be a list for your convenience of some of the documents that were used to inspire this slide deck. I've provided links to all of these documents and I believe I believe all of them can be accessed for free. If if at any time you have trouble accessing any of these documents, just send me an email and we'll we'll figure out how to get you the document without without cost. So so keep these in mind and definitely reference these in the future as you continue with your practice. The primary uh, things that I want you to really internalize today, there, there are three key points. The first is that in times of transition, it's easier to make mistakes. So QA is especially important. So all of you now are presumably in this um, time of transition from 2D radiotherapy to 3D conformal radiotherapy. And this is a really big change. It's possibly the, the biggest change that your clinic is going to make in terms of practice. And so at this point in time is the point in time where you should really be thinking strongly about your QA practices and maybe putting a little bit of extra effort into them, even if it's just, you know, temporary until you really feel confident in your practice of 3D conformal radiotherapy. The second is that the amount and the types of QA performed depends on your clinical objectives. And so this is your, your QA program for your particular clinic is going to look different from QA programs for other clinics. And this is going to be based on the types of patients that you treat, the types of techniques that you use, and also on the equipment that you have available. And so, so everyone's, everyone's QA program is going to look a little bit different. And the amount that you do is going to vary depending on your local circumstances. And finally, QA is a team effort. I think that it becomes easy to associate QA with physics because we talk about it all the time and it's our favorite thing. But QA is really something that falls on the responsibility of everyone on the team. And this is, it's really important to start thinking about it this way. And I'm going to show quite a few examples of how physicians and dosimetrists and therapists are all integral parts of the QA team. There are three learning objectives for today. So by the end of this lecture, I hope that you will feel confident to describe the components of a comprehensive quality assurance program, to describe the details and the importance of each component of a QA program, and to explain the benefits of implementing a comprehensive QA program in your clinic. So hopefully by the end of the presentation, you'll be able to, you'll feel confident in, in answering these questions. So let's jump right into the goals of a, of a QA program. The first goal, of course, is to improve your work practices to monitor risk. So to identify places in your practice where risks are more likely and the outcome of risks are more severe. So to kind of be able to monitor why things happen, how often they happen, and, and track, track those risks over time. And ultimately, the goal is to prevent major accidents from happening. So if you can monitor the risk in your clinic over time and, and plug up those, the hole where they arise, you can prevent accidents from happening um, before they happen. Another goal is to simply encourage vigilance among all of your staff. Like I mentioned, QA is a team effort. And so if, if everyone on your staff is vigilant and thinking about 
QA and safety, then you have a much stronger QA program and a stronger safety culture. And finally, we want to learn from the from our mistakes. So, so the goal of a QA program is going to be to have some sort of repository for keeping track of any errors that occur and to be able to, to learn from those mistakes and to say, um, okay, we understand now why this error occurred and we've made changes to our process so that this error will never occur again. So learning from mistakes is going to be the final important motivation of a QA program. So I wanted to start today's lecture by telling a couple stories of some famous incidents or infamous incident incidents, depending on how you want to look at it, that have happened in recent history in our field. So some, some of you, many of you may be uh, familiar with a couple of these already, but the first incident I wanted to talk about it occurred in Glasgow, UK in 2005. And it involved a young woman named Lisa Norris who was being treated for pineoblastoma with craniospinal RT. And this, this treatment of Ms. Norris was occurring uh, during a time when the clinic was undergoing a major TPS upgrade. And this upgrade resulted in a very major workflow change. So they, they upgraded to the Vera 7 system and this introduced a new feature and that was essentially just a checkbox, but it allowed for prescription data to be electronically imported from the patient chart or to be manually imported. And so most of the clinic's procedures had been updated in order to allow for this, this electronic import. And previously the clinic had been using paper charts and manual imports of all the relevant data so they changed, they changed their workflow at this time to, to utilize this new feature of the treatment planning system. However, they did not change the workflow for a few complicated sites, including the whole CNS site. And the problem with this is that what happened was there was an, a young and inexperienced planner who was unfamiliar with the treatment planning system features, um, especially the differences between the, the original planning system and the new planning system. And so what happened was this planner, when they imported the fields and the information, they selected the electronic import for the head fields, but not for the spine fields. And what this resulted in is that the normalized output factor for the head fields was calculated incorrectly. So what the planner intended was for 35 gray to be delivered in 20 fractions to the patient. But what the patient actually ended up receiving was 55.5 gray in 19 fractions, which was a 53% overdose before the error was even discovered. And of course, you can imagine, you know, 55.5 gray is, is well beyond our tolerance for the spinal cord irradiation. And so this was, this had tragic consequences. The reason why the error finally was detected was actually because the same planner was planning another craniospinal field and they made the same mistake but this time they noticed their error. And so they went back and they checked the other patients that they had planned and they noticed that this error had been made. And so this patient received, Ms. Ms. Norris received 19 fractions before they even knew that there was a major mistake made in the plan. And unfortunately, Ms. Norris died in 2006, only several months after she completed treatment. So Clearly, quite a few things went wrong here. The first of which was that we had an inexperienced planner who was not familiar with the, the features of the treatment planning system, was not familiar with the changes that were made. But, but certainly, the point of, of having a second check process, which, which we all know the importance of, 
clearly failed in this case. And after investigating this, it was found that the, the person who was second checking the plan was actually the, the young planner's supervisor. And the, that person was also involved in the planning process, the initial planning process. And so the second check was not a completely independent check. It was an observation biased check. And as a result, the second checker failed to identify the error. So, so we had two big things go wrong here that resulted in a tragedy. The second um, story I want to tell is about a clinic in Epinal, France. And this error occurred in 2004 when the clinic was transitioning from static to dynamic wedges for prostate treatments. Mm -hmm. The error, the error was made in the selection of the type of wedge, and it was introduced in um, the treatment planning system parameters when they were setting this up. And the result was that all the RT fractions that were planned for delivery with the dynamic wedge were delivered with the MU settings for a static wedge. And so as you can imagine, the, the MU settings were much, much, much too high for a dynamic wedge setting. And this problem was only identified when the software was upgraded. As a result, as a direct result, five patients passed away and 20 other patients had severe rectal toxicity. And the investigation of this case went on for quite a while, it, it seemed, when I was looking into it. And several other errors that were related to the practice of this clinic, including improper use of portal imaging and improper in-house MU calculation led to mistreatment of an additional 5,000 patients um, approximately. So this had huge, huge ramifications. And in 2007, this department was shut down temporarily in order to kind of stop everything from happening and, and require that the processes be re kind of revamped. And actually, two doctors and the physicist even stood trial and were sent to prison for, for this incident, not because it happened, but because they tried to cover up the error. So, so that's another really important lesson is, you know, if, if things go wrong, even if they're they go horribly wrong. It's really important to report these these things because there there are major ramifications, not just for patients, but for your clinics as well. So in this case, what went wrong? Well, the investigation showed that the staff had very little preparation or training for this um, transition, and they simply were not were not ready and did not understand the technology or the devices well enough to be implementing them in clinical practice. The second thing that was identified was that the manual for this uh, new feature had not been translated from English to French. And of course, this happened in France and that was the native language of, of the uh, people in the clinic. and. It's, it, it can produce major communication errors and, and loss in translation if, if your manual is for, for implementing something is not in your native language. And so I'm sure that uh, at some point your clinics have, have run into this issue. And I very strongly encourage you, if you ever receive a new product and the manual comes in a language that is not your native language, to ask the company if they can provide you with a manual in your native language so that you can be sure that all of the details and the nuances are well understood to you. And finally, there had been no independent dosimetry check. So this is a problem that I feel could have been avoided really quite easily with a couple like simple measurements. It, it would have taken you know, an hour for the physicist to kind of get on the machine and take a few output measurements and compare it, compare those measurements against what's expected. And 
it would have been it would have been identified very rapidly that the MU were not being calculated correctly for the virtual wedge. And so it's not even that the, this, this particular clinic needed to be QAing all of their patients. It's that they just needed to make a simple set of measurements initially to, to double check that the system was plan, was creating a plan that was with the MU that's expected. So, so that's another really important thing that went wrong here and should not have gone wrong. So the take home message of these stories is really that times of transition require special attention. So at this point in, in your clinical practice that you're transitioning from 2D to 3D, it's worth putting in a little bit of extra time and effort to do some extra QA and really feel confident about, about your methods and your procedures because that little bit of extra time can really um, mean a lot in terms of the ultimate outcomes of patient care. So the next thing I'm going to jump into is the Swiss cheese model for QA. The idea of this model is that each slice of Swiss cheese is a layer of defense. And these layers are either engineered, so alarms, physical barriers, auto shutdowns, interlocks. They can be procedures and they can be administrative controls. But each layer is not perfect in preventing all errors from happening and some errors slip through the holes. So these holes are due to either active errors, so a person on the team makes a mistake, or if they're due to latent conditions. So something that was no fault of anyone goes wrong. So maybe a poor design, badly designed procedure, the like treatment management was not efficient. So, so something about the conditions causes a problem in the system. And so in, in our case of radiotherapy, on one end of the uh, Swiss cheese model, we have our hazards. So um, this is basically anything that can go wrong in the, Q, uh, in the treatment process. And of course, there are a lot of them. And then on this end are our losses. So these are the, the big disasters, which usually are the, like, either a patient uh, passes away or a patient has, suffers a, an injury, or maybe even a, a staff member suffers an injury um, due to poor safety conditions. So losses are, are some sort of clinical disaster or medical event. The Swiss cheese model was originally designed by a man named James Reason, who uh, designed it in order to eliminate errors in the oil industry. And the model was then later adopted by the airline industry and now more recently by the medical industry. So in, in our model here, we have different layers that I've kind of set up as one, the first layer is our policies and procedures. So these are, the procedures that we have written down and put in place and follow on a day-to-day -day basis, our personnel and training. So of course, all of the people on our teams are our barriers to things going wrong. The better these people are at their job and the better we train them at their jobs, the, the stronger this barrier becomes. Then we have our equipment fail safes. So we have machine interlocks that are built into the system to make sure that plans that are not or that are not safe or not correct don't get delivered to the wrong patient. And then we have our equipment management. And so this this I kind of feel like the final line of defense is our, you know, our physicists who are checking doing the machine QA and, and checking to make sure that all of the physical operations of the equipment are as expected. The goal here is to design each of these barriers. And of course, there, there may be, there, there are many more than four, but to design each of these barriers so that if a hazard slips through a hole in one barrier, it does not slip through a hole in 
in a later barrier. It can be deflected by a later barrier. And ideally you'd want everything, all of the particular, all of the hazards to be deflected at as early a stage as possible. So in this particular case, this of course is not a very well designed model because we have holes where the same hazard has slipped through all of these holes and resulted in a catastrophe. But if you design your model intelligently, you should be able to deflect most errors before they cause a loss. The major message here is that a single failure should not cause a serious accident. So if in your clinic you experience a medical event and start tracing back the cause of that medical event, it shouldn't, it, you shouldn't find that it was one thing that went wrong that caused that accident. It, it, you, you will most likely find if your QA program is designed in a strong fashion that there were many failures that combined to lead to that accident. So, so that's the idea of the Swiss cheese model is that you have multiple checks in place at various stages of the medical process that prevents errors from occurring. So what should a QA program actually look like? This is kind of, this is a diagram that I kind of just drew up thinking about what, what is, what are the process, what is the process that we do? Of course, it's radiotherapy, but what does that, what are the big steps in that process? And then who are the people responsible for that? So in, in radiotherapy, what we're really doing is we're taking an MD order and that order is going to result in the simulation of a patient. And that simulation is going to be the responsibility of the MD, therapy, and physics, all in their own ways. These, these different groups are going to own different parts of this procedure. Once the simulation is complete, the, the patient goes to planning and dosimetry or physics, if you don't have a dosimetry department, is going to be primarily responsible for, for this part of the process. And of course, the MD is going to oversee the planning from a more external perspective. After planning, the patient is going to go to plan, check, and approval. And this is going to be primarily oops, the responsibility of physics. But in many clinics, the therapists also have a responsibility of making sure that data transfer occurs correctly and the patient information is correct in the system before treatment. Then the patient goes to treatment, which is mostly therapy's responsibility. And finally, the, after treatment, the MD and physics are responsible for all the documentation and summaries uh, that are required for, for the records and for documenting the patient's treatment. So once you've kind of mapped out your, your, your process, and I know that all of you have already mapped out some, some of your current workflows with our, some of our other educators at the beginning of this curriculum. So, so you probably already have some ideas of what this looks like in your head. And maybe you're even working on improving these in some ways. But, but once you've mapped out this procedure, what you should start doing is thinking about at each point in this process, what are the different things that could potentially go wrong? And so I, I listed, and this is certainly not a comprehensive list, but I listed all of the things that I thought might could potentially go wrong in each step of this process. And then once you have a list of all of the things that can go wrong, you have to start thinking about, okay, well, these are the things that can go wrong, but some of these are not really, they, they don't have a really big impact on the treatment. So you want to start asking yourself what, what, what things can go wrong are, and what are most likely to go wrong and what are the most severe, what, what things going wrong could have the most severe consequences? And so those are, the, those are the things that you really want to kind of highlight and then start putting checks in place to catch those errors. And so, so 
once you've once you've established what your hazards are, you can start putting in quality assurance along the path to try to catch those hazards. And the goal here, just like in our Swiss cheese model, is to catch the errors in the same step so that you can send it back to the beginning of this one step before it gets too far along the process. Because the farther it gets along the process, the, the higher the probability is the error is going to slip through in the end. And secondly, the more waste occurs because if you make an error in planning or simulation and it gets all the way to like the patient's treatment, like the patient's on the table ready for their first treatment and somebody identifies an error, that, that results in a lot of wasted time. Not only does the patient have to go or the patient's plan have to go all the way back to planning, but now you know you have a patient on the table and that patient can't get their treatment. And so the idea of, of having your QA along the, along the way is to prevent these types of things from happening. And so you want to, it, you want to make sure that if you put your checks in place at one level, those are going to check, those are going to catch the major errors in that level and any other errors that slip through should hopefully be caught at another level. So here I think is a good place to pause and take some questions if and if people have them. Hello. Hello. Equality assurance in CT. A reference warm up and uh, check param parameter laser. Um, yeah, so actually we're gonna talk a little bit about CT, CT SIM QA in the next lecture, but yeah, you're, you're right. Uh, the quality assurance that you wanna do on like a daily basis for CT SIM is that you're gonna wanna check your lasers and your alignment, your distance from where the the setup the virtual setup ISO center is and the the physical ISO center of the CT scanner and then it's also really important to check the that the CT number of water is constant on a daily basis just to make sure that your your CT to electron density calibration curve has not changed over time equality assurance in the planning what so for example, here we show there are, there are quite a bit of opportunities for QA in treatment planning. What my particular clinic does is that the MD will normally draw the targets into the, into the uh, CT sim and dosimetry will QA the targets by, you know, checking like, is this where we expect it to be? Do we see any other places that look suspicious? And then they, the dosimetry will also contour all the normal structures. And so once the, once dosimetry is caught for the normal structures and has um, set up the fields for the MD, the dosimetrist then sends the plan back to the MD who will check and approve that the dosimetrist has set up the, the plan the way that the MD wants that to happen. So, so we have some cross-checking of, of contours going on, both targets and normal structures. We also do something called chart rounds, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later, and we're actually going to have a full lecture about later in the curriculum. And this is a place where we have multiple MDs present and a physicist and a dosimetrist present and they review all of the patients that are starting treatment, but either before their treatment or within the first week of their treatment. And so that's a form of peer review that can um, help to verify that the, the plan or the, the treatment, the prescription, the modality of treatment is appropriate for that patient and other MDs can give input on that. Yeah. Yep. We have a, a good question in the, in the chat from Abdo and it, he's wondering if all the procedures are, if all the QA procedures are good and appropriate, does this mean that there's no chance of error? Ah, that's a very good question. There 
I, I would say that there is always some probability of risk. As a physicist, that there's there's not that there, we're not we're never confident to say that there's no way that a mistake is going to be made if our QA is perfect. I think that the better your QA procedure is, the more likely or the less likely it is for hazards to occur and for errors to occur. But I don't think that it's possible to ever say that we can 100% eliminate all errors. Thank you, Tia. Other questions here, or shall we continue? Okay, I'm going to continue. So the goal here is to predict errors and insert checkpoints in order to minimize their occurrence. Very briefly, I'm going to touch on machine QA, but I'm going to go into this in more detail in the next lecture. Machine QA is probably the most familiar form of QA for, for physicists, and we have different frequencies at which machine QA is, is performed, and these are on daily, weekly, monthly, annual, and as-needed basis. Generally, the more frequently you perform a type of QA, the simpler and faster the test should be, but you should be testing the things that are most critical and most likely to result in big problems. So your daily QA, you're only going to be checking a couple of things. It's only gonna take you 15 minutes, 30 minutes at most, but those things are going to be the most critical things. So you want to do all of your safety checks. You want to spot check your outputs and make sure that something like big didn't change overnight. Whereas with your annual QA, you're going to be checking things in much more detail. However, the types of tests that you're doing might be more involved. They might, and they, they might also have less of a major influence on the um, outcomes, like the immediate outcomes of patient treatment. And of course, you should always be doing QA after a major service or repair or after a hardware or software upgrade. The frequency at which you perform QA is, should depend on several factors. First, the likelihood of failure. Secondly, the severity of the consequences. Third, the ease of the test and the required resources. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, your own local circumstances. So for, I'd like, for an example here, we, in my previous clinic, we used to perform QA every month on the couch position accuracy. So making sure that when we move the couch 20 centimeters to the right, it actually moves 20 centimeters to the right. Did this test ever fail? No, not in the 18 months that I spent QAing several different machines did I ever see this test fail. Did it take very long? No, not really. It only took maybe 30 minutes, but we had a huge team of physicists four residents and like six postdocs that were um, available to split the workload of QA. And so there wasn't really a huge drawback to checking this. However, for a clinic that only has a couple of physicists who are treating 100 patients a day on two machines, is it worthwhile to QA the couch position? Yes, but is it, Q, is, it, is it worthwhile to QA it every month when we expect it to pretty much never be wrong? Probably not. And so these are the types of things that you should be thinking about when you're developing your QA program is thinking, okay, what are, what are the things that are actually likely to go wrong in, in my clinic? And, and how can I ensure that those get checked on a regular basis while still making sure that we have time to do everything that we need to do. And then finally, just our, our different classes of machine QA, safety, mechanical, dosimetry, and imaging. We'll get into these a little bit more next time. A very important concept that I wanted to cover today is the idea of tolerance levels versus action levels. 
So tolerance is an acceptable deviation above which risk of harm is moderate and a change in process or an adjustment is recommended but not obligatory. On the other hand, an action level defines the deviation above which the risk of harm is high and a change in the process or an adjustment is obligatory before treatment can continue. So an example of this is for, in, in my clinic, our machine outputs on a monthly basis, the tolerance level is 2%, but the action level is 3%. So what that means is that when we start to see our um, outputs drifting up to the 2% deviation level in our monthly QAs, that's when we start and say, hmm, these are looking a little bit high, it's probably time to start thinking of making an adjustment. Now, at 2%, the, the impact is not considered to be uh, detri like incredibly detrimental to the patient's treatment. And so if we're at 2% and there's some other thing that is more pressing and needs to be taken care of, you don't need, you can still treat the next day without making an adjustment. However, if our outputs were measured at uh, the 3% level and, and, and we, found, we decided that this, was, this, this measurement was, was reliable, then the risk of harm to our patients is now at what we declare high and an adjustment has to be made immediately before the treatment of patients can continue. Action levels are importantly quantitative and they reflect the required outcome. So if your clinic wants to make sure that the dose is, the, the prescription dose is delivered to the GTV within 2% error for every patient, you don't want to set your output action levels at 10% because if your output starts to drift, there's no way you're going to be able to achieve your clinical goals of that 2% delivery. But also importantly, action levels are informed by the achievable outcome. If your action levels are set too tightly, they can't be realistically achieved. And if they're set too loosely, you can't identify an unsatisfactory practice. So a good example of this would be, let's say you have an old Linac and you know that you can reliably achieve a 3% uncertainty on your output, but obtaining a 1% uncertainty is, is out of the question. You wouldn't want to set your action level at 3% because that's typically what, what you expect to see with this particular machine because it's old and, and it's, un, it's not maybe as reliable as it used to be. So that in that case, you, you don't want to set your action level at 3%. You maybe want to set it at 5%, but you don't want to set it too loose. So you don't want to set it up, to, up at 10% because then you would never be able to, you, you have such a broad spectrum of, of things that, that you would never be able to identify whether the practice was, was unsatisfactory or not. The action levels should be unambiguous. So, so this, the action levels are not up for interpretation. If your action level is 3%, when your outputs hit 3% deviation, you say stop and you make a change. You don't, you don't think about it a little bit and, and argue as, as to why it may or may not need to be changed. You should, you should set the action level with this in mind that when, when you achieve your action level or if you achieve an action level, this is a time when, when we have to actually stop treatment. And so that's something to keep in mind also. Your action levels should be easy to understand. And finally, although, although the, the action level is, is not up for interpretation, it's also not set in stone forever. So you can change your action level over time as your practice improves. So if we go back to our old machine that's only accurate to within 
let's say now you're you decommission that machine and now you have a brand new electus energy and we know that this linac has an extremely reproducible output and you can definitely achieve a 1% uncertainty on a regular basis in that case it's perfectly reasonable to now say okay well we now have this machine that performs so much better than our old machine and so now maybe a 5% action level is too high. So at that point, you can say, okay, well, now we can pull that action level in to 3%. And as a result, your practice will improve because you now have this better, this better machine, this more reliable machine, and you identify at an earlier level when something is starting to drift out of, out of tolerance, out of action, out of your action level. So to hit on the point of QA being everyone's responsibility, we have this concept of peer review. Every member of the radiation oncology team should know his or her responsibilities, be trained to perform them, know what actions are to be taken if a test falls outside of action levels. Oops, and that's it. <laughs> So, so the next things I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to try to go through them fairly rapidly so that we don't go over time, is that the, the things I'm about to talk about are what we're striving for as a field. And we completely understand that for a lot of clinics, some of these recommendations are just completely unfeasible at the moment. And in all complete honesty, in North America, we have not yet fully achieved our goals of a completely like comprehensive peer review system in this field. But we are, you know, striving for these goals and we're, we're making baby steps towards achieving these goals. And so any, anything that, you know, kind of sticks with you and you feel can be um, implemented in your clinic without a high amount of of use of resources is something that can really benefit in the long run. So the idea of peer review is that each team member is going to be responsible for their own types of quality assurance. So this can range from typical second checks review up by the physicist to the radiation therapist is going to do a procedure timeout with, with a particular patient before they start treatment. So for those of you who don't know, are not familiar with the idea, the concept of a timeout, this term simply means that before a procedure is performed, basically all of the medical professionals who are involved in that procedure just take a pause and they focus on the patient and they make sure that all of the information matches up that they know what they're treating correctly, or they know that they're treating, you know, this, this site with this prescription, the patient has these allergies, you know, we're not going to use anything that the patient's allergic to. So this is just literally a, a pause before the procedure is done in order to make sure that all of the information that the, that the MD has all of the information that the person, the therapists who are treating are going to be treating the correct site. Um, and so, so this is a QA step that's the responsibility of a radiation therapist. And then peer review is kind of, it's another type of QA, but it's the responsibilities fall on other members of your, of your team. So physicians, we, we talked about chart rounds before, so, so they might check other physician plans for like the dose selection and the technique selection for a particular patient. A dosimetrist might um, assess the selection of the beam orientation and, and weighting, or the, they, they might double check the plan optimization. So each team member has different quality assurance tasks and peer review tasks that they can be responsible for. So I did say that, that you are going to have a whole session on chart rounds, but I wanted to kind of give a very brief overview here because there are some important ideas to think about if you want to develop your own chart rounds program in your clinic. So 
the first question you might want to answer is at what point in the process, the treatment process, do you want to review patients? Are you going to do this before the first fraction or within the first week of treatment? And in each of these cases, the type of chart rounds might look very different. And so you should think about what the implications of doing it at each of these time points would be. Secondly, is the question of which patients are going to go to chart rounds. Some clinics review every patient, but this might not be feasible at your, at your clinic. If you have only a few physicians and many, many new starts every week, it might be completely unfeasible to review every patient. So perhaps you want to limit your chart rounds to certain disease sites. So then you might ask which patients have priority. So let's say your, your clinic treats lots of prostate patients. So let's say, let's say that every year you treat a couple hundred prostate patients. Maybe your clinic then has a really good idea of how to plan prostate. And you know, your, your dosimetrists or your physicists are very well practiced at this. And it's, it's maybe less important for prostate patients to go to chart rounds because you're very familiar with treating them, but maybe you treat a lot fewer lung cancers. And so maybe if you, if you only treat a couple of lung cancers every year, you want all of your lung patients to go to chart rounds just because your physicians are less familiar with treating lung cancers. And so that's how you can kind of think about which, prior, which patients have priority for chart rounds. One thing that's really important is that you should include all patients who have either unexpected or severe complications with their treatment. Logistics is another big, big issue for chart rounds. You need to have, it, or it's recommended that you have at least two MDs present at every chart rounds because you need at least one MD has, has patients that need to be reviewed by another MD. So you need at least two MDs and at least one physicist. And if it's applicable uh, to your clinic, at least one dosimetrist. And you can include trainees for educational purposes. The key to this is that all of these people who need to be present at chart rounds have to be available at the same time slot every week, or not the same time slot, but in the chart rounds time slot every week. And this can be really, really challenging when developing and establishing a chart rounds program to find a, an hour every week that all of the people who need to be there are actually available. This opens up the idea of electronic review, which is made possible by all of our new technologies. And it's a really great option for some clinics. However, you, you must consider the patient privacy laws in your country and, and make sure that you abide by those. But on the other hand, it really opens the door for external collaboration. So there's no reason why your chart rounds should only be within your clinic. If you anonymize all of your patient data appropriately, all of you could create like an international chart rounds. And that could really help with the, some of the logistics in that it might be a lot easier for two MDs and a physicist to be present if they don't all have to be from the same clinic. So this is, these are also some, some important things to think about. And then finally, I called this section cultural barrier, barriers. This is really just the question of how can you create a safe environment so that everyone who's participating can be willing to give or accept criticism. And so this is a challenge in every clinic, but it's, it's, it's something that needs to be discussed openly. And this brings into the, into the discussion this idea of safety culture. And when, when, we're trying, when we're talking about a safety culture, we're really talking about all of these things and the colorful dots here. And this is not a complete list by any means, but all staff should be encouraged to report all safety events, whether or not it results in harm. Mm -hmm. So this, this is our, this, this comes back to the idea of everyone being mobilized. It's everybody's responsibility. And 
the most important thing here is to create a positive environment where or no punitive action is taken against people who report report errors, report safety events. So the reporting of these should be should be encouraged and also the people responsible for the safety event should also be handled with care and and those people should not be necessarily punished either. The the idea is that we want everybody to be mobilized and everybody to be working towards creating a safer uh, workplace for both the employees and the patients. And there's actually literature that has described that when you create a positive safety culture, it actually results in fewer adverse events for those clinics. I know that we're starting to get close to the hour and I have... Yeah, could, I, could I just interrupt quick, quickly? There's another good question in the, in the chat. Yeah. Um, this one from Mohammed is asking, what, what are the basis, basis for determining the tolerances for patient-specific QA? The, so the, determining the tolerances for patient-specific QA. So this is, again, I guess we should go back to this slide here. So, so tolerances and action levels can be picked. The, the standard is given by one of the AAPM TG reports. And typically the, the distance to agreement should be within two millimeters and the 2% or two millimeters is, is the, the standard that's used around the US mostly with a 90% passing rate. I've also seen 95% passing rate. However, this, this is one of those things where it might be it's dependent on your measurement devices. It's dependent on your machine's capabilities. And so the overall recommendations for the U.S. or, or the recommendations from the IAEA might not fully be able to describe what your clinic is capable of. And so it's a really good recommendation, a good place to start. But if you find that you have a lot of plans that fail at a recommended, a recommended action level or a recommended tolerance level, then you should maybe reevaluate. You should, you should hunt down the, the source of those failures and try to understand, well, is this because my machine is simply not capable of delivering the plans to within this tolerance? And in that case, maybe I should loosen up my tolerance levels or is am, like am I making a measurement error that's resulting in the the pass rates not being what I expect and so really understanding what what is going on in the QA process and where the problems might occur can help to inform you um, about how to set your tolerance levels much better than just reading a document and and taking those numbers um, and implementing them. So I want to get to, to, to the end of this presentation. I'm going to skip reporting policies for now. You can certainly read about them on your own in the slides that, that will be provided for you. One thing I did actually want to cover, though, is the idea of incident learning, which is a, it's a hot topic in our field for the past, I'd say, maybe 20 years. And it's recommended that there be a centralized system in place to report incidents that occur in the, in the clinic. And these should include events that reach the patient with or without harm near misses, so events that did not reach the patient, any unsafe conditions, or any operational improvements that can be made. And the goal is that we should be able to like collectively look at all of the incidents that occur and learn from events in order to reduce their frequency and severity. 
these events should be reviewed regularly and studied and it's often recommended that there be um, a safety committee or safety rounds that reviews these incidents on like a weekly or or monthly basis and just you know identify the ones that are categorize them in a certain way and identify the ones that are like more severe and then safety information should also be disseminated to the rest of the team in a variety of fashions so just as an example of an incident learning system in my own clinic we have we have a place where everyone can uh, anyone in the clinic so this is physicians physicists therapists dosimetrists and anyone can report any sort of incident that results in one of these things or or even others and the other week our safety committee leader brought an issue to our physics meeting that had been reported that on one day, oops, sorry, on one day, the morning physicist came in and, and there were 15 patients that were starting the same day who still needed second checks. And while this is partially the responsibility of the early physicists to help with the second checks, this was a very large number of patients than are normally left over from the day before. And so the goal of bringing this um, to the attention of the team was not to criticize the physicist from the day before or to necessarily even solve the problem right away, but to just make everyone aware that this happened and to start brainstorming ideas for, you know, well, first of all, why did it happen on this particular occasion? Were there extenuating circumstances that it resulted in it? Or, or is this something that has been happening regularly and people haven't been reporting and points to a big operational issue. And so the, the purpose of the incident learning system is not to be punitive towards anyone. It's simply just to learn from the things that are going on in the clinic and try to make your practice better. And incident learning systems don't have to be only uh, in one institution. They can also be inter-institutional. And a really good example of this is ROYALS, which is the Radiation Oncology Incident Learning System, which is sponsored by, the, by ASTRO and AAPM um, in, in North America. And ROYALS is basically uh, an inter-institutional incident learning system that has 550 participating facilities across the country. And it's a, a very large database where all, all incidents can be re re reported. And the thing that's really nice about Royals is, you know, we can go to their webpage and they, the first thing that they have on there is, here's, here's some, how you can sign up for office hours so that you can get support for implementing your own incident learning system in, or, or incident learning program in your clinic. So they offer these services and then they also have right at the top of their page safety notices. So being part of this large incident learning system allows issues that are related to maybe even types of treatments that your clinic doesn't do yet or has not yet commissioned. And you can, you can get um, access to really important information about bugs that have been discovered by other clinics and their uh, particular significance. Tia, there's another question in the chat yeah. from Abdul. What's the difference between an incident and an accident? Oh, that's a good question. So I would say, I would say that an, an incident is just, it can be any sort of occurrence that maybe it, it could be anything small from, you know, this patient's, this, this patient's chart was missing this piece of data, whereas an accident is something that usually occurs and results in harm. That's, that's how I would describe it. I don't know if you would describe it differently, Derek. Okay. So let's see. We can go through this. This is not extremely critical. So, so in these slides, I'm, I'm just presenting the idea of developing a quality assurance committee and their responsibilities 
I don't think we really need to go through them. You can certainly read through them on your own. But the idea of a quality assurance committee is basically to like have a system in place that can review incidents when they occur and to you know monitor all of the appropriate compliance with local and national change, but also to be a, a committee which is capable of actually implementing change that has the power to implement change in the clinic when a change is, is seen as necessary. Just concluding the presentation, QA requires resources, monetary and otherwise. The biggest of these resources is probably just time. The t- like time is required for commissioning, for QA, for writing reports, sitting in meetings, training, receiving your own training or giving training to other staff. All of this requires time and it's important when you're communicating with the administrators of your clinic to be able to explain why this time is is important and why it's why this is a good way to be spending um, this time. It also requires dedicated staff with the appropriate qualifications. Your, your, the people performing your QA should know what they're doing and why they're doing it. And it also requires dedicated equipment. And so that's kind of the, the like one side of the money aspect is that you, you need to make sure that you have um, the necessary instruments. You don't need to have all the fancy instruments, but necessary instruments and, and the phantoms that are, are needed in order to perform the QA. The benefits of QA are improved, overall improved patient care and an improved management system. When you have your processes QA'd, your, your clinical workflow just works a lot better. Improved safety, and that's for your employees and for patients. And improved communication among all members of the staff when everyone is mobilized. And finally, and most importantly, I think, less overall waste. So even though, and this this is another really important aspect of making this argument to your superiors, is that even though upfront QA looks like it's taking hours out of your day, hours out of the clinic, it requires extra staffing. By doing a little bit of QA upfront, you can save a lot of waste in the long run. Think about that process map from the beginning of the presentation. If you have a little bit of QA plugged into each stage of the process, you have fewer errors that are slipping through the cracks and getting down later into the process, requiring you to go all the way back and start over again. So so less waste is a really huge benefit to doing QA. And in the end, you can you can really find a good balance between the amount of time you're putting into QA and the amount of benefit you're gaining from it. So hopefully at this point, you can describe the components of a comprehensive QA program and describe the details and importance of each of these components and explain the benefits of implementing a comprehensive QA program. Once again, in times of transition, it's easier to make mistakes. So QA is especially important right now. The amount and the types of QA performed are going, is going to depend on your clinical objectives and QA is a team effort. So now I can answer any further questions that may be lingering in your minds. Let's see. Yeah, there are a couple of questions in the chat. One from Masood. What about QA if there is frequent gap during treatment? So I guess if you are not treating very many patients, what would your QA strategy be? That's a great question. So this is actually, if you, if you have gaps in between your patients and they're long enough, like 30 minutes or an hour, this is a great time to do your QA. If, if you have to make patient-specific measurements, this is often a really good time to do that. Anything that doesn't require a major setup 
can definitely be done in between patients. And even, even certain parts of the monthly QA can be set up uh, in between patients if you have a large gap. I've I've known physicists at, at smaller clinics who might have like a two hour gap in time in between their patients. And so they'll do part of their monthly QA then. So that's that's a really great way to, to optimize your time. Thanks, thanks for that, Tia. Another question from Bastoon Hassan. The TLD dosimetry system that is run by the IAEA is performed in many clinics every other year, so every second year. How helpful is this in terms of machine QA? So I'm not extremely familiar with this, but I imagine this is kind of like the IROC QA. It is, yeah. It's um, okay, yeah. So this is not so this is not specifically designed to be machine QA. However, it's a really good thing to do to uh, be able to compare uh, yourself against international standards. And so if you've, if you've recently done your like annual output calibration and then you, you run the IAEA TLDs, this is a really good way to double check that you've, you've done your calibration correctly and you're falling within the recommended guidelines of the IAEA. Okay. Tia, thank you so much for a really great presentation. I wanted to mention that someone, someone in the chat mentioned that this should be split up into two lectures. There's such a lot of good information there and nobody wants to rush through it, of course. So really great job. Thank you for all the great information. Just for, for everybody on the call, if you want to reach out to, to Tia with any questions by email, certainly feel free to do that. She, she's easy to find on, on the UC San Diego websites. And I'm sure she would be happy to take questions by email. She's also just sent us in her chat, her email address. Tia, thank you so much. A really, really great lecture. All the best, everyone. Thanks, everyone. And I will see you again on Sunday morning for uh, the second half of this lecture that already should have been two parts, I guess. So also remember, I've gotten some of the homework assignments from some of you so far, and that's really great. I'm going to have a look at them today and tomorrow. And if you haven't yet sent me the homework assignment, it would be really helpful if you could get it to me before a Sunday. So thank you again, everyone. I'm sorry I went a little bit over, but have a really nice evening. Today's lecture is going to be an extension of what we started talking about on Thursday. Um, and I'm going to focus uh, specifically on, on Linat QA and trend tracking this week at this, this session. So just to get started, there are, these are the, the resources that I put in the previous presentation. And these are some reports that are going to outline the AAPM and IAEA recommendations for QA. And I've, I've put the direct links in here, so you should be able to access these, these, these reports with, with the link. And if, if you have any problems with accessing the report, if it sends you to payment requests, just let us know and, and we'll make sure that you get a copy of the report. So today's key takeaways are going to be that QA requires resources, and these resources are both monetary and otherwise time, manpower. The second is that 3D conformal radiotherapy introduces new complexities that may be unfamiliar to you as of right now. So it's critical to identify what these new complexities are and be especially attentive to them in this time of transition. And finally, that adequate documentation of QA and trend tracking can help to ensure quality and patient safety. Our learning objectives today will be to first, the, that you'll, by the end of the presentation, you should be able to describe the elements of Lynette QA that are essential uh, to ensuring safe 3D conformal radiotherapy understand action levels and how to set them, and understand the basic functions of total QA.
to review my, my last presentation, we talked about the Swiss cheese model of quality assurance, where we, in between our hazards in radiation oncology and the losses, which are usually harm to the patient, we, we set up these barriers of quality assurance and, and each, each slice of the cheese is a, is a barrier. And these can be bar things like policies and procedures that ensure safe practice, the personnel in your department and the specific training that these people get, the equipment fail safes, such as alarms, physical barriers, interlocks, and finally, equipment management. So this is going to be your like machine QA and the, ensuring that your devices have been recently calibrated. And in each of these barriers, we have holes. So the holes in the cheese are the the are, are due to errors and just weaknesses in the barriers themselves. And hazards can sometimes slip through these holes. Oops. And the idea here is that you should be able to set up your barriers such that something like this, where a hazard slips through all of these holes, doesn't happen. Ideally, if a hazard slips through a hole in one barrier, it should be deflected by another barrier. So the goal here is to make sure that a single error never leads to a, a loss and to design your QA program so that errors that are uh, missed by one layer of defense are um, caught by another layer of defense. And we uh, talked about this diagram, which shows kind of a simplification of what a QA program should look like. And the idea here is that you want to map out your process for for many of our procedures this starts with an md order and goes through the simulation planning plan check and approval treatment and then the completion of therapy and at each step in this process we identify the people who are responsible for the safe practice of this of this step and then very importantly, we have to identify the potential hazards that might, might lead to a significant error or a loss. And so at each step in the procedure, we wanna identify all of the potential hazards and then kind of organize these potential hazards into the hazards that are likely to happen most often due to weaknesses in our process or uh, the hazards that are likely to result in a very significant loss. And at this stage, we, we want to put into place different quality assurance tasks that address those errors and, and try to catch them early on in the process so that an error that is made early in the process doesn't end up resulting in a problem later on. When, when our QA doesn't catch these errors that are made, it results in not only potential harm to the patient, but also waste in our system. And so the more efficient we can make our QA, the less likely we are to waste our resources when when a patient has to when, when a patient who's who's had an error slip through the cracks has to go back to an early stage in the process to to redo a mistake that was made early on so we mentioned that our key points last time were that times of transition require more attention a single error should never result in serious effects we should predict the errors that are likely to occur and insert checkpoints to minimize their occurrence. And finally, that QA is everyone's responsibility. QA is a team effort. So this brought us to the concept of safety culture and a positive safety culture or in a positive safety culture, staff should always be encouraged to report all safety events. And this is whether or not 
the event results in harm or a loss. Creating a positive safety culture requires that punitive action is not taken towards people who report safety events, and instead that these reports are used to simply inform and to be learned from. Thank you. And finally, we, we learned that a positive safety culture is associated with fewer adverse events in the clinic. So these, these objectives are, are very important to try to encourage in your clinic. So moving on to more of the topic of today's lecture, uh, we mentioned last time that machine QA uh, has, it involves tests that get performed at different frequencies. And the more frequent you perform tests, the faster they should be or the easier they should be to perform. And the less frequent tests can be more complex. And these, these sorts of QA, such as monthly and annual, will often take much longer to complete. And the frequency of your tests should be informed by the likelihood of a failure, the severity of the consequences of an error being made or um, something being wrong, the ease of performing the test and the required resources, as well as your local circumstances. So when you consider all of these things put together, you want to, in order to optimize your QA process, you, you want to make sure that you're checking all of the things that need to be checked regularly because they are, they can potentially cause losses to the clinic, but you want to balance that with how easily you can perform the test, how much time you have in order to implement these QA checks. So you don't want to be performing tests that take an hour or two hours every day because that's completely unfeasible. If, if a test, if you don't have the equipment to perform a test quickly, you should be able to think of ways in order to perform those tests so that you can check the things that you need to check without utilizing too much time. And finally, that our tests fall into four, general, uh, four classes, and these are general safety, mechanical accuracy, dosimetric accuracy, and imaging. So I'm just going to kind of quickly move through some of the highlights from TG142, which is the AAPM uh, task group on machine QA and recommendations. And I don't want to spend, uh, I don't want to belabor this too much because you can easily go to the document and, and have a look for yourself at what the recommendations are. And I don't want to, I don't want to spend too much time boring the MDs on the call with QA specifics. But, but in general, for 3D conformal, we're looking at the non-IMRT column of these charts. And so the, this column is going to have the least restrictive tolerances. And, but, but when, so, so with, with newer machines, uh, you might be able to easily meet I, the IMRT column or the SRS SBRT column, even um, even though you're not performing these these types of treatments, just because the machines have been designed in order to achieve these tolerances. So you can also keep that in mind when you're doing your QA that that you might be able to achieve much better than what this column recommends. So it's recommended on a daily basis. You should be spot checking your outputs for all energies. And this can be done with either an ion chamber and solid water and a quick measurement, a single measurement at every energy. But there are also many companies which offer devices that are specifically made for quick morning measurements. And I think one of the best known is the DQA3 device by Sun Nuclear, which is what 
my clinic uses. So this device is really nice, but it's also very expensive. And so your clinic might not be able to, it, 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 this might not be something that your clinic is able to get. And so we can, we can be creative with the equipment that we do have and design tests that utilize that equipment. So for a daily QA, it's recommended that the tests come out within 3% of baseline. Um, and then for uh, mechanicals, all localization equipment, so lasers, ODI, uh, front pointer, if you use that for your treatments, should be checked uh, before any patients are treated. And these types of tests uh, might look different depending on the type of machine that you have or the types of treatments that you perform on that machine. And finally, all safety interlocks should be tested before treatment every day just to make sure that they're functional. For monthly QA, the, the main point is that you're going to probably be performing a few more tests for monthly and also that the I'm so sorry, I need to get a power cable for my computer. I'll be right back. Are there any questions right now from the audience? I think one point that Tia made is good is sometimes in these guidelines we see numbers, but uh, sometimes we can do better than these numbers. I agree. I also should add that the volatium uh, tolerances are more of a recommendation. They're not like guidelines that we have to abide by, but that's what they recommend. We usually do aim to have uh, tighter tolerances, but you, you it, it's based on what you have in the clinic, right? You come up with best practice that you can afford. And Sarah, do you think it's the case sometimes that maybe due to limitations of your clinic that it's that you can't meet the numbers? It could be, yes. For example, um, I think someone earlier on was giving the example of having an old machine where you can't have it tight enough, right? And then you just have to work with the mind. So you include that, for example, when you're creating your PTV. And, and then in that case, should they, should they set different standards for their clinic? That way it's, it's the same across different physicists and physicians? Yes, I would believe so. Yes, then they would come up with their own standards. I don't know, for example, machine X, you can have your tolerance as uh, three millimeters, and then they would, they would set guidelines for the physicians and other physicists. And then you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure if this happens, but sometimes maybe we're trying to meet a certain a certain number when we're doing our QA. And sometimes the physicists are working on their own and not communicating. So if, if you find that it's hard to meet a certain number, maybe it's good to bring it to attention and to mention it and see if others have the same difficulty. That's right, that's right. And uh, sometimes you also need some facts on us to do better. And then hopefully, but I guess, what we typically do QA is we compare with what we had last year, right? It's the also consistency. So you started the practice, you communicate with everyone, and then you pay attention, you make sure that there's no drift. If there's a drift, how much is it? And can you fix it or then just can adjust the practice across boards and make sure communication is the word. You're absolutely right. This is do you maybe want to say it in Arabic? I think it's an important point. <laughs> sure, sure, of course, of course. So, uh, the Kerem on the double APM recommendations and different class groups and so forth. After the machine and the end of the game, after the 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 Tosil and Arum, I guess the Tosil and Arum, the Mua Kamel, after the Mishmishkele in the double APM, consistency and communication is the word that is uh, critical. See so far? Okay, I think they're all good. Uh, I did not hear it. I asked if they have also questions or if they need clarification. Okay, someone said, what's the name of the device that you would use for the monthly QA? If I'm understanding it correctly. From Mayada. So, Tia, do you want me to answer this? 
Sure, yes. So the question was, what's the name of the QA device for monthly QA? That's my understanding of everything, yes. Okay, so typically for monthly QA, we, we, so in my clinic, we simply use solid water and an ion chamber for our dosimetry. We have a couple of devices that are useful for other tests. So for the laser localization, we use a tool called ISOALIGN which is, it's just a simple device that has like a crosshair on it that you can align with the machine ISO center and then it rotates so that you can check that against the lasers in all directions. So that's, that's a tool that I really like. I'm not sure how expensive it is. I, I think it makes the, the process really simple to check your ISO center and the laser alignment. And I guess, yeah, there there are quite a few other devices that I'll I'll mention in the in the presentation, but keep in mind that although these devices can really simplify the process of making some measurements, they also can be very expensive, and so it's possible to make all of these measurements in a uh, to to be creative and to develop techniques for making these measurements with what you have so definitely don't ever feel like you you have to get a 2d detector array in order to make these tests because although they're really nice they're not they're not completely necessary so so don't feel like just because like you can't your clinic can't afford a particular device there's no way you can perform the qa because there are lots of techniques for doing these things that's absolutely right and uh, following for that with the example of laser right you can really use a piece of paper that somebody yeah. says parents and ju just put it in the middle and make sure that your lasers are aligned with each other that's a simple, uh, way to check that your lasers are aligned with each other. Ion chamber is for us, what is typical and for check. As you said, you, don't, you, you, you do not need a 2 array actually for uh, yeah. monthly QA. If you were to argue for play, it's films, you could, they're, they're, you make use with what you guys have in the clinic. And you could use super simple things. You could use a ruler and a piece of paper, really, right? Yeah, Graphic. for sure. A lot of tests also, especially for like light field and light field tests and, and jaw position tests, you can, you can simply use a piece of graph paper with, with, with millimeter spacing. That's, that's a tool that has been, I found really useful for some types of QA. So you definitely don't need expensive equipment to do good QA. Uh, is that clear? Well, Ahmed, or do you, do you want me to translate? So I'm guessing it's clear. Tia Karad Bidgul, it's very output, um, the energy check with this thermal solar water or ion chamber. Mojoot? Okay. Show for your city. The metabolic absolute measurement is the water tank. Sah? Moya. Sah? Solid water slabs? No, no, I'm not. Okay. Okay, you can do monthly for water. It's just not convenient. But the problem is that it's harder. There's something solid water, but it's plastic. But it's not plastic. It's made of a certain way that the electron density will be like the water. So it's not solid water. But if you don't have it, you can use water. It's just like a tank, and you can use it like that. So you can do that on a monthly basis for your chocolate. Okay? That's the absolute dose, as you said. Okay. The laser is a magic device of the laser center. The lasers, you need further attention. Solid water. شلون؟ The daily QA. شنو بتعمله؟ هو إحنا ال لا لا هاي أكو هو إحنا نسميه unit يعني هي ب برابات وب يعني نقاط. Okay okay. So if you use on daily, you use 
זה כאילו פלסטיק? זה... אוקיי. ובזכותי לך... אי גס. אני חושב שאתה יכול לראות את זה בשביל המאפי. אבל מה שהם משתמשים בדיילי QA זה גם איזון צ'אמבר. ואני חושב שזה פלסטיק כמו פנטום. זה יכול להיות סולד. It's a cube, and it has different holes and different, de and different depths. So I believe she could use that also for the monkey um, ring, instead of having to roll out her water tank every month. Okay, yeah, so I think, but yeah, I'm not familiar with that device. The water tank is definitely, like, that's a great way to check outputs, but it, it sounds, but depending on whether it's a, a 1D tank or a 3D tank, that can take a really long time, I think. So yeah, you can, if you have solid water, that's a really good way to do your monthly outputs. I, I'm not, yeah, I'm not familiar with the device with, with multiple holes in it, but there's, there's probably a way that you can use that to check your, your outputs. So basically, may I that what I would do if I were, if I were you, what is my annual QA, what is my annual measurement, You're going to have the calibration. You're going to see the color, okay? Yes. Okay. You set the numbers. You don't have to be on monthly, for example, in QA. And after that, you set numbers. You do it on a daily QA. Okay, there. I found it. Does that make sense? Abdul, Abdul is saying, can we depend on our chamber? Thank you. Thank you. Ah, you're welcome. You're welcome, my pleasure. Okay. Can we depend on our chamber and our chamber of calibration? that ended for around five years or more, what is the this table? So for absolute, do you want to answer or do you want to answer, Tia? Uh, you can go ahead, that's great, yeah. Well, uh, iron chambers, if you're going to take absolute measurements, like for annual QA, you have to have a, a chamber that was calibrated within the last two years. If you cannot send your iron chamber for, I mean, you should have in the clinic at least one iron chamber that's calibrated two years. If you want to use an older one, I know that it's not advised to use it for TV51. If you want to use it for a monthly QA, then at least perform a cross calibration, do an internal calibration in your facility. Use your chamber that's calibrated from an ADCL lab. You'll turn that calibration factor in other steel chamber that hasn't been calibrated in the last five years and do your own calibration for it. And then you can use it. Does that make sense? Uh, excuse me. Uh, yes, it makes sense, but the problem is if we cannot send it outside to for calibration. And is there any clinic nearby that could have, uh, possibly have like uh, a calibrated iron chamber that you could at least cross calibrate your chamber? Uh, but you, you see, the the stability of the reading is stable. When we take the measurement, it is always uh, stable. So. I, I think can we depend on it, uh, whatever we do it in that. I think it's not ideal to not have a calibrated chamber, but I completely understand if it's not possible. And so if you, if you know the history of your measurements, you have, you, you have kept like spreadsheets over time and you can tell that the chamber seems to be stable, that's, that's a good backup analysis. But if there's, yeah, if there's any way at all, you can, you can cross check this measurement with, with a calibrated chamber from another clinic, that would, that would definitely be a good thing. The, the problem with not having the chamber calibrated is that we know that machines can, can drift over time and And so if your ion chamber is changing in a small way and your machine changes, it can look like the chamber is stable even if it isn't. And so that's why we like to have a second check. But, but it's, it's good, it's, it's at least good to know that the history of your measurements in the chamber and that's, it's better than nothing. Also, do you have chambers, even if they're like old in the facility? Or do you have just one, the one chamber? We just have only one chamber. Strongly advised against that. I mean, even if it's not ADCL labs, I know, I don't know how the situation is now, but I know you have uh, King Faisal Hospital, for example, in Saudi Arabia. They do cross calibrate for neighboring countries. So even if not, where are you at, in Yemen? 
Okay. Do you think you can, for example, send your chamber electrometer to Saudi Arabia to Riyadh? We'll try to do such a thing. We'll, we'll, we'll try to solve this problem and I'll check with our manager to solve this problem. Okay. And then? Okay. Thank is, you very much. Is it, is it more like logistics? Is it like, I'm not sure if people used to have to pay a King Faisal or not. But if, if they would do it for free, is that, is that an option? Like, do you think you guys can ship it and they can cross calibrate it and send it back to you guys? Actually, it will be good it is, if it will be free. But the problem is, how can we send it to them to, in order to make the calibration? It is difficult to send these uh, items to them. But at the, at, the, at the moment, we can just check with our managers and we can ask them to give us another solution to send this uh, cal for calibration. Yeah, well, check and let me know. If you're, um, I do have friends there, and I'm sure they're, they're more than happy to help. Just Okay, I will take your email and I will contact you if we solve this problem with our uh, management. Perfect, sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. That's a really great question. Thank you for that question. Shall we um, continue on? I think so. I see that Mayad just said I meant uh, the monthly QA. So I will just comment and say, yes, Mayad, we were our. Oh. Yes. Oh. But yes, Mayada, we were talking about the multi QA. So, what I'm saying is, a shahri mukit amali with the Jizuminu in the queue checking an output fagal machine for each for each beam, sah? Jizuminu mechanical test, Jizuminu flatness and symmetry. If you could hear checks for the monthly, Tah the Kra of the Moya, or by then Tamil set up Hagi Hagal monthly, Tah the Kra of the Sajiliha. بناء على الإمكانيات الموجودة عندي أيوة. وفي في برضو يعني يا جماعة I designed الحاجة دي for my monthly queue what do you guys think وإحنا we'll give you feedback إنه أوكي دي أوكي شكرا حفا أوكي آه ما تفاجئنا هلا أوكي I think you can take over now <laughs> okay <laughs> so just kind of moving through, I think that we had a good discussion about monthly QAs. For the mechanical QAs, the things that I wanted to highlight are especially the cross-check between your, your lasers and your front pointer and the optical distance indicator, if your machine has one. And this can look different. The, the, these types of tests can look a little bit different depending on the type of machine that you have. In my experience, the Electa front pointer is not a very reliable device. And so a better thing to use is, is to localize your lasers first with good accuracy and check those against your optical distance indicator. Whereas with a Siemens machine or with a Varian machine, the, the front pointer tends to be a much more stable device and it's very reliable to check your distances to ISO center. And so in, in the case of a Varian machine or a Siemens machine, you might choose to use your front pointer in order to localize your lasers. Another important thing to check is that all of your accessory trays, so your, your BB tray, the block tray, um, wedges, hard wedges, if you use hard wedges, first that they are all latching correctly, so just as a safety precaution, and also that the accuracy of their latching is, is accurate. So you, you want your, your BB tray, if you're using a BB tray for port images, to be accurate within a couple of millimeters. And, and as um, Sarah mentioned, and as we've mentioned before, this of course is dependent on what what you know your machine is capable of achieving and these are these are just recommendations and so 
don't don't worry if your machine can't achieve that the goal is to be able to track what your machine can achieve and check that it's that you're getting that constancy on a monthly basis so i'm not going to spend a ton of time on this stuff but it, you want to check your wedge factors on a monthly basis so basic, a spot check is usually sufficient for that with a single energy you can you can make a measurement at the central axis for the wedge for a wedged field and for an open field and that can just verify especially for a dynamic wedge or a virtual wedge that those are operating correctly and multi-leaf collimators these if if you're using them for the mlc there are certain tests that should be done and and i'll give a little bit more detail also there's imaging qa you're going to get a whole lecture on imaging qa in a week or two and so i'm not going to spend a lot of time we talked about action levels last time, and action levels must be quantitative. They should reflect the required outcomes. So what, what are you trying to achieve with your, with your treatments should define those goals first. And then you, you can make your QA tests. You can define the action levels so that they reflect that outcome that you're trying to achieve. They should be informed by your achievable outcomes. And so, like we said, if you make your action levels too tight, they won't be able to be realistically achieved and you're always going to be getting errors and warnings based on that action level. And so if, like we said, if you can only achieve 5% accuracy with your output for, for some reason, but you set your action level at 3%, you're always going to be getting errors and warnings, even though your machine is operating normally for what your machine can do. However, if you set that action level at 10%, which is potentially too loose, you won't be able to identify unsatisfactory practice. So you'll never know when the machine um, starts to slip out of its normal operation. But one important thing is that your action level should be unambiguous. And so you, you don't want this to be up for interpretation. When uh, you're... You, I think you froze. Yeah, I think frozen. Is this? Um, action levels aren't set in stone. They can be tightened as your practice improved. And, and so if you get a new machine and now this machine can achieve outputs within 2%, you can change your action level to reflect that improvement in your practice. Now, a good way to be able to set your action levels is to track the trends in your machine performance. And this will show your machine stability over time. And it can inform how frequently a test should be performed. So if you find that you're checking, for example, your couch motion accuracy, and you check your couch motion accuracy every month, and in an entire year, you've never had to make an adjustment to that motion, that can indicate that this is a very stable mechanical aspect of your machine. And perhaps you don't need to be checking it as often, and maybe it's sufficient to check the couch motion accuracy on a quarterly basis. And so, so these, these are the ways that you can really make your um, practice more efficient, is to be able to track the trends in the machine performance and then tune your QA process to be optimal in the amount of time it takes to do the tests and, the, and, and to optimize the, the outcome of those tests. Trend tracking can also help to inform if an adjustment is, an ex is expected or to predict a malfunction. And so a really uh, useful thing with trend tracking I found is that if you do your daily QA measurements with, with one system and then you have monthly QA measurements with a second system, if you notice with your daily measurements that there's a drift in your output, for example, when monthly comes around, you can already expect whether or not you, you, you think that a change will be warranted in your output. 
And so if you see that your monthly measurement is slipping out of tolerance or approaching your action level, you can then go back and look at your daily measurements and you can say, okay, well, this, this, is, this is probably not an error on my part because I also noticed that the daily measurements are slipping out of tolerance. And so that's a really good way to second check yourself and be able to say, I think that a change in the output is warranted because both of these measurements are showing the same thing. Um, trend tracking can also help to inform your achievable accuracy. So the, you, can, you can be able to see the noise in your measurements and, and how much that measurement tends to vary over time. Like, so maybe, maybe you don't see a, cons a, a trend, like an increasing or a decreasing trend, but there's a lot of variability in the measurement itself, then you can, that can help to inform where you set your tolerance levels so that one day if you make a measurement and just because of the noise in the measurement, it happens to be out of tolerance, you don't flag that as an error. And like I said, you can cross check infrequent tests with frequent ones. And you can also compare between your, your Linux within your institution or within different institutions or nearby institutions. So if you have the same machine as another clinic nearby, you can, you can look at their machine performance over time and uh, see whether your, my, your machine is performing consistent with what other uh, machines of the same type are doing, or if uh, you can potentially improve the practice. So we're starting to run a little short on time. So I'm gonna kind of focus on just a couple of things before I move on to showing you a little bit of uh, total QA. But some of the things that we should be really particularly aware of in the transition from 2D to 3D are the use of a CT simulator, the multi-leaf collimator becoming potentially more important, onboard imaging systems, and your treatment planning system, which might be new to many of you. CT simulator, there's, there's an APM TG report number 66, which has recommendations for how a CT simulator should be QA'd and what the frequency and tolerance limits are. But the, the goal of your CT simulator is for accurate patient treatment planning, the CT scanner must provide high quality images with geometrical and spatial integrity, and especially with a known CT number to electron density relationship. And this is really um, critical. So this CT number to electron density, CT is described, the tolerances are, are described in this NCRP report number 99, which you can have a look at. And your calibration curve for converting a CT number to electron density should be determined and verified during your initial commissioning process and should be checked on, on a regular basis. So my clinic checks this, checks this for many, for several electron densities every year, but we check the CT number for water every day. So this, this can be simply done using like a container full of water in the CT scanner. It's, it's as simple as that for a daily QA check. But basically you wanna check that this is, this is a constant value every day. And it's recommended that the CT number for at least five materials be checked monthly. And, and you can, there are some commercial phantoms for this, but you can also make your own phantoms with, with materials that you have access to. And, and this, is, this is an example of, of what one of the commercial phantoms look like. So this is a big like water equivalent phantom and it has little inserts in it that have different material electron densities. And so you just take a scan of this and you can, you can measure the Huntsfield value of each of these inserts. So, so imitating something like that is, is, is possible with materials that you have around. In a previous lecture, it was mentioned that having dedicated CT protocols for radiotherapy simulations can eliminate 
the worry about potentially scanning with the wrong KVP, which would then lead to dose calculation errors. And so, so making those specific protocols and, and checking those protocols regularly to make sure that they haven't been changed is, is a way to ensure that the wrong KVP, which would result in the wrong CT to ED conversion, is used. And the CTED, like I said, is so important because if it's not correct, your dose calculation won't be accurate. And if your dose calculation isn't accurate, then you're not going to be delivering the correct dose to your patient. I'm going to skip over CT dose symmetry for now. So the multi-leaf collimator is, this might be your first experience with using the MLC. For the purpose of 3D conformal, the required tests are simple, but the complexity of these tests and the number of tests that should be that should be run on a regular basis increases rapidly as you transition towards using IMRT. So starting your understanding with the behavior of your MLC early on is important so that you can make, if you understand your MLC now, your transition to IMRT later on will be much easier. So one of the things that's really important to check is your light field radiation coincidence. And this should be checked with both jaw defined and MLC defined fields. And this is gonna have a slightly different meaning depending on whether you use a, an Electa or a Varian machine because the MLCs are designed differently in each of these machines. Oops. But the importance of this test is that, of course, your therapists are setting up with a light field quite frequently, and you want to make sure that when they set up with that light field, that it's reflecting the actual radiation field that's going to be delivered. And so I've, there are a couple of ways that I know you can check this quite simply. I'm not sure how much you guys use film in your clinics, but a really simple way to check radiation light field coincidence is with film. You can put like the film packet on the on the table and mark the light field and then irradiate the film and and check the the coincidence of the field edges with your with your markings that you've made. And let's see we talked about that. Another test that is used for the multi-leaf collimator is called the picket fence test. And this test is designed so that you irradiate little one millimeter wide strips with two CM spacing usually in order to check the position accuracy of your MLC. And for those of you who have EPID panels, this can be done with the EPID panel very easily or it can be done again on film. And the goal here is just that you can see, so this is, this is a picket fence that's performed with the MLCs calibrated correctly. And then this is a picket fence where we've introduced shifts in the position accuracy of the MLC. And so you can see that the, the intensity of the irradiated strip is not constant where these errors have been introduced. And so this is a really good qualitative way of being able to check each of your MLCs and whether they're in need of a position calibration. I'm gonna skip daily integrated QA for now because we're gonna have another lecture on that. And you guys will have these slides. So if you have questions about it, feel free to send me an email. Finally, the treatment planning system is something that you may or may not choose to QA. I have worked in, I have worked in one clinic that does QA their TPS annually. And I've also worked in a clinic that does not QA their TPS. And so there, there are different arguments that can be made to either of these. So for people who do QA their TPS annually, what they typically do is that they have one or more plans that you run on an annual basis just to make sure that the TPS calculates the same results. So this is very fast and simple. You can do it in you know, 
10 to 20 minutes. And it's a really good way just to check that your treatment planning system is operating the way that you expect it to. Some clinics, though, don't think that it's necessary to QA the TPS annually because if they have their treatment planning system locked down with the permissions set correctly, then any, any like regular user of the system is not able to make changes unless they're intentional and deliberate. And also, there are really good processes in place to document any changes to the treatment planning system. So based on the, the way that you have your treatment planning system implemented in the clinic, you may choose to check it on a regular basis or not. But regardless of whether your clinic decides to check the QA, the TPS annually, Initial commissioning of your TPS and continued careful commissioning of any software updates or new dose engines or optimization algorithms is critical. And all of that should be done very carefully and documented carefully. Okay, so we're coming around the top of the hour. I guess I want to pause for questions here in case there are any before I move on. It looks good to you. Okay. So I'll try to get through this in another 15 minutes. Hopefully you guys can stick around for that. But if you need to jump off the call, I totally understand. So information flow in radiotherapy is a complex process. And you must ensure that the transmission of information is accurate. And this requires careful and complete documentation of QA. Your, any forms that you use for documentation should be simple and easy to follow. And this is because everyone's really busy all the time. And so you want to make sure that errors aren't made in like filling out um, forms that might be really important to patient care. And all of your QA documentation should be kept in one place. So whether you keep your uh, QA documentation in paper form or electronic form, it should all be in a, it should all be kept together and everyone who needs that information should know where to find it. What my clinic uses is this system called Total QA by Image Owl. And this system is a unified platform for quality assurance, which is vendor agnostic. And so it, it's compatible with any vendor, any device, any machine. So that's really nice because you can, you don't have to keep your QA information in like different softwares. It can all be imported into this total QA or TQA system so that it can be analyzed by anyone who um, has a total QA account. And Image Owl has graciously donated licenses for TQA to each of your clinics, and that's what I've been working on setting up for your templates. So a little bit more information about TQA is that this platform provides standardization for your QA and your tests. It's a unified storage for logbooks, spreadsheets, and machine maintenance. It offers you control over user permissions, and so people who are performing QA but maybe aren't allowed to make changes to the system, you can, you can control what, what permissions they have and how much access they have to the system. And it provides a meaningful presentation of data and this, especially this trend tracking feature. It allows for manual entry of data or even device integration. So if you do have a, a device like the Daily QA3, you can set up the TQA system so that with a single button click, it just imports all of the data that's been collected by that system and stores it for you in the TQA system, which is really nice. And especially nice is that it doesn't require any dedicated hardware or IT support. All of the updates to um, the platform are pushed automatically, and it doesn't require any um, maintenance on uh, your part as the clinic. 
and you can learn more about TQA and Image Owl at their website. And then I'm going to give um, a quick overview of the platform and then show you what I've been working on setting up so that you can see what you will have access to. So when you log into TQA, what you'll see is a list of your clinics. So this is, this is our clinic here and each of our machines. So we have our, our two TrueBeam machines, a Halcyon, a, a Clinac, and then our two CT scanners. And under each of these machines are all of the schedules that for QA that are available. And each of these schedules has a due date. So you can see daily QA is due tomorrow. And for this machine, the monthly QA is due in five days. So that, that can provide information on, on when you need to complete your QA. So clicking on one of these schedules will open up a template. So this is the monthly dosimetry template and it provides different fields for entry of data measurements. And then it will automatically calculate the average of these measurements and based on calibration factors that are set up in the system, it will also calculate your output and the deviation from the baseline that's set up. So that really, it, it basically is, if it, maybe you have a spreadsheet that does this right now, but this, it will, this is all integrated into the system. And then it, on, on this side, you can see a list of all of the tests that are in this template. So you can click through these tests or scroll down. There's the review tab will allow you to see all of the recently completed QA tasks as well as all of those tasks that are in progress. And physicists who perform these tasks or, or your QA assistants can leave comments if measurements are taken under special conditions. So in this case, the monthly outputs were taken twice because we got new electrometers. And so the, the QA was first performed with the new electrometer and then it was performed a second time just to be able to cross-check the measurements of the two electrometers and make sure that the outputs were calculated the same. Or if you have a failing test, for example, the, the person who performed that test can write a note about what, what failed and if they notice any conditions about why it failed. So the person reviewing these tests can then go through and, and have a little bit more information. So if we then clicked on the report for uh, this machine, it would open up the report and all the measurements that were made. Green dots indicate tests that passed. Black dots are just showing tests that don't have tolerances or, or action limits associated with them yet. And this gives a, a full summary of the information that of all your measurements and then the calculated deviations. So another nice thing about TQA, and, and this might be beyond the level at which you wish to use it right now, but it also has all of these really nice built-in tests based on different phantoms that you might have. So for this example, this is a test that, that's called the Winston Lutz test, and it basically checks the coincidence of uh, mechanical isocenter and radiation isocenter. And it's used typically to verify this for, for SRS or SBRT treatments. And so all we need to do for this is that we take measurement or we, we take images of this phantom once we've set it up. And all we have to do is import the images into the system. And the system automatically analyzes these images and outputs the measurement results. So this helps to really simplify a lot of tests that might re otherwise require a lot of manual analysis or labor and, and makes these things go a lot faster. Here's another example of a, a built-in imaging test for the picket fence that we talked about a little earlier. So I mentioned that a picket fence can be done and be a really nice uh, way to qualitatively observe whether your NLCs are functioning correctly because this is now a digital test in this system, you can actually get quantitative data about your MLC positions and be able to track this data over time and then see whether any of the MLCs need either replaced or calibrated.
So I also mentioned that I like to cross check the daily QA data with the monthly QA data. And so this is where I think TQA really shines is your ability to look at trends over the full history of your machine as, as long as you've been keeping it in the system. So these are our daily QA measurements. And then these are our monthly QA measurements. And what we can observe here is that there's actually a lot of data that's kind of embedded or a lot of information that's embedded in this data that you can actually observe. So, so this is where I really see the value of trend tracking. So what happened here is that on September 23rd of 2019, this machine needed an ion chamber replacement. And that's, we can see like a large downspike. This is where the ion chamber was replaced. And on this day, we performed a TG51 and we brought the machine back to its baseline. And then we validated that measurement with the daily QA device. And once you replace an ion chamber, you expect that that chamber is going to drift for a while as, as the burn-in effect takes place. And so we can see this as um, a very clear change in slope of the daily output measurements. So here it was much more stable and then it started to rapidly drift over time as the burn-in effect took place. And so this occurred such that outputs needed to be adjusted twice. And so we knew that the output was drifting over time based on the daily QA measurement. And so when we hit our action level here in the monthly, we knew that an output adjustment was appropriate at these two occurrences. So then on, in, in June of 2020, we did another, we did an annual QA, we performed TG51 and we brought the machine energy, all of the machine energies back to baseline to within less than half a percent. And so now our outputs are laying on top of each other much more nice, much nicely, much, much better. <laughs> And now that the machine is, or that the ion chamber is about a year old, we can actually see that the chamber drift has started to level off. And so now, now it's, it's mostly, it's mostly left, burned in at this point. And you can actually observe that in the daily output data. So that's, that's what I think is really cool about this system. Skip that. So let's take a quick look at the, the templates that I set up for you guys. So when, when I'm going to start pushing out invitations to you to start using um, the software, and when um, you log in, I've already set up all of the machine information for the clinics that have sent me specific machine information. And you can see for each of these clinics, there's a QA schedule attached to, the, to each Linux for a monthly QA. And if we click on one of these schedules, we can open up the template. And right now, all of these templates are, are, are very similar with a few differences that I, I've put in place based on the information that has been provided to me about what you currently do for QA, how your machines were calibrated. So I've, I've taken the information about your machines and the information that you provided in your homework assignments for those who have submitted their homework assignments already, um, and I've started to integrate that into the templates. So what, if, if you were then to start using this template, for example, with the gantry angle, if you, if you measured your gantry angle for zero degrees, and let's say on this particular month, it came out at one degree, you'll see that it calculates the difference from your um, expected outcome, and in this case, it's within tolerance, so it passes. If, however, it was two degrees off, now you'll see that the block turns red, so that indicates that the test has failed because the measurement is out of tolerance, and so this shows that an adjustment should be made to this particular gantry angle. Another example, so, so you can also put in, I've put in some pass-fail tests here for more qualitative tests. So if you check your crosshair centering for the walkout of the couch rotation, if you find that your crosshair walkout does not exceed a millimeter, you can, you can click the pass button, or if, it's, if it looks like the couch is 
has a bad walkout and needs to be adjusted, you can click the fail button to indicate that that should be adjusted. Now, with the dosimetry right now, this isn't completely set up yet because I still need more information from all of you. And so if I try to enter data, it will show me that no active calibration factors are found for this machine. And that's the next thing that we're gonna want to set up. So, so I have these templates set up so that um, you can measure the outputs. And then I also have the energy ratios plugged into the template as well. And so these are, this is basically, this template has been ad adapted from the TG142 uh, tests that I was talking about earlier. And it's, it's right now a very general template with what I think are tests that are important to perform on a monthly basis. However, you, based on what you do in your clinic currently, we can either make customized adjustments to your own specific template very easily, or you can simply ignore some of the tests that are in here if you don't if you don't have them implemented yet, and you can implement them over time as you uh, develop your QA program and and the practices in your clinic. So one of the tabs you won't have right now is this manage tab. And so this is what I've been working in to uh, manage your templates. So I just want to kind of show you what I'm capable of doing for you so that if you want to make adjustments to your templates or customize them more for your particular clinic, we can certainly do that. So I have these settings programmed in. So each of you provided me with the types of machines that you have and the energies that your machines have. And so each, each of your templates is gonna have your own clinic specific energies. This clinic has 6X, 10X, and 6X FFF on this machine and these electron energies. And so the test will be customized to those. We also have, I've, I've input some of the parameters based on your homework assignments and the, the calibration con conditions that you have used or, and the monthly conditions that you use for your checks. And so uh, your, your templates will be customized based on that information as well. So what the other thing that I can easily adjust for you in addition to all of this information is the tolerances. And so we can go in here and we can look at what I've, what I've set up for tolerances. And so here I've set up that your tolerance limit for the gantry angle is 1.5 degrees from the absolute value of the test. So at zero degrees, we have plus or minus 1.5. And then your action limit, the point at which you should make an adjustment to the machine is at 1.99. And so anything over 1.99 is going to cause a test fail. For your dosimetry measurements, these are set up slightly differently. So these are set up against baseline. So this is, this is a relative test and it's going to require your guys' participation in setting up those values so that we can make this template useful for you. And so this test shows the deviation from baseline is the tolerance limit is set at 2% right now, but if your clinic uses something different, we can certainly change that. The action limits are right now set at 3%. So all of this is, is very customizable, so it's really easy. The other thing that I asked from you was your measurement devices. So what, what TQA does is it also stores information about all the devices that you use for measurements. So in this clinic, they, they have a farmer chamber and that farmer chamber information I stored in here. So it has some basic information about the chamber and about some of the values of that chamber. And we can also have calibration factors for the chamber. So if you have a calibrated chamber, we can input this information directly. But the other thing that we can do, and, and the next thing that we'll need to do in order to finalize these templates for your clinic, is set up the machine-specific calibration. 
So these, these values will be, these can be set up either as absolute cal calibration factors or can be set up as uh, relative calibration factors in terms of like nanocoulombs per centigrade based on how you do your monthly measurements. So what we're going to be doing is setting up your electrometer and ion chamber systems that you use for your monthly QAs um, and, and putting in each of these, uh, these conversion factors. Uh, and that, that will either, if you have like spreadsheet information, that will be really easy. And, and I'll just send you in your next homework assignment, I'll either ask you to provide these factors directly to me or to measure them so that we can, we can set them up for you. And then you'll be able to start using this template and hopefully we'll find that it really helps to improve how your QA is performed in your clinic and your ability to make decisions about what sorts of tests are and what frequency of those tests is required. So like I mentioned, the next steps are to be that we want to finish configuring each of your devices. So please, if, if your clinic has machines, has access to functioning machines, and you want to continue to set up your, your machines and devices for your clinic, please um, submit that information that I requested and, and submit your homework assignments. And for those of you who don't have machines yet, don't worry, you can contact me at any time in the future, and we can definitely get one of these templates going for you. So, so please be in contact. And then the next step will be to update all of the calibration factors for your machines and device measurements, your device calibrations. And finally will be to actually uh, make the measurements in order to check that we've set up the template correctly for you and your clinic. And so this, this will happen in another homework assignment. So if you haven't yet sent me the information for your first homework assignment, please do so whenever you have time. And then within another week or so, I will put together another homework assignment that I'll send out to you. And for that one, I'll give you more time to complete it because it will be a little bit more involved. So in conclusion, your machines should be QA'd at different levels on a daily, monthly, annual basis. And there are several key differences between 2D RT and 3D conformal, which will require particular attention, including those having to do with your treatment planning system, your CT scanner, MLC imaging. And so those, those will require a little bit extra attention to detail. Your action levels should be chosen taking into account what is achievable and what is the clinical impact. Trend tracking is useful for monitoring machine stability and predicting failures. And a really uh, good tool for, for all of this is, that to is Total QA, and this um, system enables thorough documentation and trend tracking through a simple system requiring very little resources on your behalf. So this helps to strike the balance between expense and benefit of QA. So hopefully at this point, you can describe some of the elements of Linac QA that are essential to ensuring safe 3D conformal radiotherapy. Hopefully you understand the action, action levels a little bit better and how to set them. And finally, that you understand the basic functions of total QA and why it might be useful for your clinic. Their key takeaways, again, is that QA is going to require resources, and these are monetary and otherwise. 3D conformal RT introduces new complexities that might be unfamiliar. And so it's really critical to identify these and be extremely attentive or extra attentive in times of transition. And finally, the adequate documentation of QA and trend tracking can help to ensure quality and patient safety. So I'll take any more questions at this time that you might have. I know that we're, we're well past the hour and so I understand 
I'm, I'm sorry for going so far over, but I think that we had a really good discussion earlier in the, in the session. Any questions, guys? Okay. Looks like everyone is happy. There is a polling, so I'm going to launch. Okay. Hey, Sarah, let's, let's launch this, this second question. Sorry, not this one. Not this one? Yeah. Uh, and polling then, I guess. Oh, uh, you did it already. QA. Okay. okay. Okay, here. This is the right. This is the right poll, everyone. Sorry, I tell you what, you wanted both of them. I thought. Sorry. Okay. So yeah, thank you so much, Tia. This is amazing. I just want to check. It. So this is our way of checking in with everyone on this call. Please let us know if you understand the total QA, and and if you're interested for your clinic. That way, we we can make sure. If you don't fully understand, but you still are interested, we'll we'll make sure that you do understand. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate you spending an extra half hour today to stick around for the, the, the end of this lecture. I, I really hope that for those of you who, uh, or it seems like everyone seem, is interested in Total QA, and I, I would love to help you more in understanding it and helping to set this up for you. I understand that it might take some time. It's definitely been challenging for me learning more about the system. And so I hope to help you guys learn as I learn more as well. And I, I really think that you'll find it useful and helpful and hopefully really easy to use as well. So I, I really look forward uh, to making this, to implementing this with you guys in your clinics over time. So I, I think that we can end today's lecture if uh, that's okay with everyone. Thank you very much, Tia. Appreciate it. All right, great. I will just have a mechanical or a phone pointer. I thought these typically come automatically with the machine. Though. Engineer, maybe you can check with him. Ask for one. Because typically we, that's how you know that your system theater is accurate. Because it's Okay, perfect. Well, thank you, everyone. I think this was a great session. Thank you very much, Tia. And you all enjoy your um, evening. Thank you. Bye-bye.